Good morning, all. Good morning across the world. As Jodeep mentioned, this program is live streamed. Let me begin by stating with all of you, precision medicine does not work. Not without you guys. Not without your expertise and experience that will shape this technology and incorporate it into our current healthcare system. Sorry, I forgot to bring my slide pusher here. I was gonna say next slide. But technology by itself is not enough. It is the way we work with this technology that will really shape its future. But as Dr. Papanikolaou said almost 50 years ago, presciently, we don't save lives in the laboratory. And even if it's a great discovery to find something, true healthcare changes lives where people are. So I'm an Agvora, as Dr. Joydeep mentioned, uh, and I'm the medical director of uh, CSD. And as a genomic solutions provider, I'd like to share with you a little bit about our vision of where this technology is today and where it's going into the future. And I would start with the overarching promise of precision medicine. It has four key attributes. The first and foremost is that it lets us comprehensively assess patients for the first time in a new and revolutionary manner at the molecular level, optimizing treatments while minimizing toxicities. Second, all assays and tests need to be able to accurately and robustly identify individual variable markers at the patient level rather than at the disease level, which we do currently. Third, and probably most importantly, the mutations that we identify need to be clinically actionable. And what do I mean by clinically actionable? That they have prognostic, predictive, or therapeutic implications. Otherwise, it puts the clinical doctor in a, in a quandary. What do I do with this information? And something that's often overlooked in our search for newer, better, and greater technology. So let's begin with where precision medicine is today. So for the last 20 or so some years, we've identified numerous mutations which have been associated with cancer. However, identifying these mutations was often slow, laborious, and certainly wasn't cost effective. Over the last several years, dramatic improvements have been made in this technology. And we're very proud um, at Thermo Fisher to be part of that process. And we're able to identify mutations, multiple mutations simultaneously in a much more cost effective manner, but more importantly, directly tied with therapy. For example, if you are a patient with advanced non-small cell lung cancer, and we are able to identify the EGFR mutation, you qualify for a highly effective class of agents called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And in the screen behind me, you can see pre and post treatment in a patient who has metastatic cancer to the brain in the CT scan. And we can see agents such as gefitinib have dramatic important impact on patients pre and post treatment and it is the standard of care currently. Unfortunately, despite the dramatic effects of these powerful agents, 60 to 50 to 60% of patients will acquire resistance to their medications. And this will decrease the effectiveness of their care, and they'll have progression of disease. One of them, and I'll point it out specifically, is T790M mutation, which causes recurrence of the tumor and growth of this tumor. Now, fortunately, there are newer agents out there, uh, third-generation TKIs, which have been shown to improve progression-free survival, and ozimertinib is one of them. But unfortunately, to identify this mutation, to be able to place the patient on this drug, the patient requires another surgical invasive procedure, in this case, a CT-guided biopsy. And remember, these patients are usually older and frail and already suffering from the morbidities of their cancer diagnosis. So why do we need to keep taking biopsies on these patients? We have to remember cancer is a moving target. Cancer grows and progresses based not only its own individual inherent capacity, but also how we treat these cancers and what, what chemotherapeutic agents we throw at them. So I certainly think that capturing genomic information from a surgical biopsy is essential, especially for initial diagnosis. But it's only a snapshot of the genomic information of that patient at that point in time, when the sample was procured. 
not the patient currently or into the future. So then the question then becomes, how do we find resistance before it appears? And I think the way to approach it is to turn our attention away from simply surgical biopsies and what I call next generation biospecimens. And these include exosomes and cell-free DNA, otherwise termed liquid biopsies. And I think this will be the true test of precision medicine. It's real time individual profiling of the human molecular genome to look at for resistance and treatment possibilities. And I want to take a moment and point out that liquid biopsies are not simply blood, even though that is the most common use of liquid biopsies is utilizing blood. In fact, it could be taken from a whole host of various uh, areas within the body. For example, if we were interested in bladder cancer, we would be better off utilizing and querying urine rather than blood because more mutations are detectable in urine. So I want to make sure we understand that last point. Okay, so how does this work in real life? Here's a, um, a retrospective uh, analysis looking at cell-free DNA and comparing it to conventional methods of screening, which is uh, CT scans for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And what we're able to show with cell-free DNA is we are able to identify mutations earlier which predict either change in resistance or progression of disease earlier than conventional methods. If we look at months nine and 10, we can see an uptick in cell-free DNA or allele fractions of the mutation I mentioned to you before, the T790M mutations. And if we corresponding look down, we do not see growth in, in the right lung during that side. However, if we go to months 12, we see that same tumor showing up. And so we were able to identify these mutations before we saw a progression of disease and before we saw resistance. Cell-free DNA monitoring or liquid biopsy allows real-time monitoring of disease, which lets us not only modify treatment before we see resistance, but before treatment fails or there's progression of disease. But monitoring by itself is not the answer. Monitoring simply blindly or very, very large mutational panels of four or 500 genes does not help us get to the answer we want, but rather it's focused inquiry into clinically relevant mutations, ones that are actionable. And again, those have predictive, prognostic, or therapeutic indications, because these are the only ones proven to help patients and save lives. Okay, let's shift now and let's talk about the future of precision medicine. What does the future of precision medicine hold? Certainly, there'll be improvements in technology with both on the, the technical side as well as the, the data storage side. And there'll be improvements in the chemistry. And all of these factors will be iterative and they will help in the future. However, the biggest thing I think that will really play a role in the future of medicine is the increasing use across disciplines. And so whether you work in prenatal testing or you do forensic genomics or immuno-oncology, it's the underlying platform and technology that you utilize that will have the greatest impact on what you do. It's not so much about the cell lines you use, but they need to be, these platforms need to be able to work on real patients and real patient samples. The assays and instruments that we utilize have to be robust and accurate enough to work in a busy clinical lab. It, and it isn't just about accuracy. It's about delivering results and working with samples, these next generation samples, such as needle core biopsies, FNAs, and cell-free DNA, which have small DNA input amounts, which affects our ability to give out results. And the, the limits of this technology were recently tested when the National Cancer Institute utilize the ion torrent platform over competing platforms for their comprehensive sequencing technology to conduct the match trial. And for those of you who know, the match trial was a, a large comprehensive test looking at a trial, looking at NGS, and looking for specific mutations matched to competing therapy. And it was over 6,000 patients, over 1,000 different sites. 
And the key takeaways were that it demonstrated not only the accuracy and robustness of the Ankhmine platform, but more importantly, the reproducibility across sites, both from an academic and commercial setting. And because of the inherent strengths within the Ankhmine platform, the match trial was actually expanded to include these next generation biospecimens, which were previously excluded because they did not work with low sample input amounts. So if we truly expect next generation sequencing to be the next big thing, to make an impact in patient care, it needs to be able to work with next generation biospecimens. Now, what are the challenges ahead? I would say it's twofold. One is access to care and testing. The second one is education. So let me begin with access to care. Currently, the majority of patients that potentially have actionable mutations are not tested, and this is a travesty. The second is the ones that are tested and actual mutations are identified. 90 to 95% of these patients are not actually enrolled in clinical trials. And the reason is, is because access to testing is based in academic centers and specialty molecular labs. We need to make an effort to democratize healthcare and offer testing at the local level, at the local hospital for these patients. Because remember, access to treatment begins with access to testing. So let me end with that. Um, certainly, genomics will play a pivotal role in, in changing the paradigm of current medical healthcare. And, and I'm sure everyone agrees with that. Where I want to really focus on that the future precision medicine isn't simply about technology or even sequencing, but rather it's about empowering the physician to look at the patient in a, in a whole new way at the molecular level which they were never able to do previously. And, and I think focusing on the individuality of the patient, that complete comprehensive manner is what is gonna push us forward. But I will caution us with that, and I will end with where I began, which is that it is up to all of us as a community to responsibly incorporate in this, this technology and bring precision medicine to the forefront of medicine rather than the exception that it is currently. So with that, I, I thank you.